hey guys welcome back in this lesson we'll be creating our solution and our api project using visual studio now i'm using 2022 and that is the only way that you'll get done at six but if you're using 2019 then you should be able to follow along quite easily using dotnet 5. so we can go ahead and create a new project and i well traditionally you would go ahead and select the template you want but because we know we're going to have an api we're going to have client apps all in the solution i'm going to start off with a blank solution so if you don't have it in the recent project templates you can always just type in blank and just look for blank solution so we go ahead and select that and i'm calling this solution bookstore app then go ahead and hit create once you've done that then you will get well a blank solution now we need to put some projects in there now i have my solution explorer to my left you probably would have it to your right by default but it is something that you can actually drag and drop into the section that you feel most comfortable with it being in so i prefer mine to the left but the functionality will remain the same so let us right click our solution and go down to add then we select new project and then we can choose our API project template. So if you have it in the recent project templates, no problem. Otherwise you can always just search for API and that template should appear. If it still does not appear, please revisit the installation instructions and ensure that you have the workload for web development selected. So we can go ahead and select that template and I'm going to call this one bookstore app dot api so it is clear what this project is for then we can hit next i will be proceeding with the dotnet 6 framework and typically you would want to choose your authentication type but then that's they have different options for the api than they would for the regular web app and the option that i really want for, at least for this uh series of activities would be the individual accounts however it's not there so i'm going to leave it at none and we can set that up later on i can leave the configure for http https enabled we don't need docker and you can go ahead and use controllers and enable open api support so we go ahead and hit create now, once that project is created, what we have is a sample or a standard boilerplate layout of API of an API project for .NET or .NET Core. So if you're using .NET 5, you may see some differences and we're going to go through those differences in the next lesson where I give you a tour of each file and folder and we can see exactly what each one is doing. For now, however, let us go ahead and hit our start button just to see what we get out of the box. And this is a good site. So what we have here is Swagger, right? So Swagger is supported by SmartBear and it's built on top of the open API specification, which is an option that we left enabled when we were creating our project. And what Swagger does is it gives you a document or at least documentation surrounding all of your endpoints, what the data that might be returned looks like and what the codes would be and all of those things. So Swagger comes built into .NET 5 and .NET 6. If you're using .NET 3.1, or .NET Core 3.1, you may have to do some manual effort to integrate Swagger into your API, but out of the box with .NET 5 and 6, you will have access to this document. Another cool thing about it is that it's actually a web app that allows you to test out the API. So throughout the duration of this course, we will be flipping between Swagger and Postman when we're making or, or doing our tests rather, because they're both capable of triggering requests and displaying the response information based on what the endpoint will provide. So that's really it for creating our project. When we come back, I'm going to walk you through each file and folder so you can have a full understanding of what is going on. Hey guys, welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to be walking through all of the files that got generated with our project creation. So let's start off with a solution. We created a blank solution and the solution is really just like a register of all of the projects. In theory, when you are solving a problem, you are applying a solution. So the solution really is the directory for all of the projects and files that will be used to address the problem, right? In practicality, it's really just a folder housing a bunch of folders and files. 
So that moves us on to the first project that we have, and we will have multiple projects in this one solution. But this project is our API project. And when I click that project file, you'll notice that it opens up this XML file, which is just like configurations. One, it's telling us the target framework, which is .NET 6. If you use .NET 5, then it would say not fi .NET 5.0. If you're using .NET Core 3.1, it would say .NET Core 3.1. It also has some other configurations, which you will see the use of as we go along. I'm not trying to explain too much at this point, just so you can have an appreciation of what's going on. And then we have this item group, which is housing the packages being made reference to. So we, we, we will be using new get package manager as we go along, and that will help us to manage the different libraries and third party um, tools that will help us to make our development easier. So that's the CS proj file. Once again, that is really just representing a folder. And then inside of that folder, are all of the files for that project. So we have connected services. We have nothing at this time. We have dependencies and you'll see some default libraries that are like out of the box with every project. Under packages, you will see the same packages being made reference to inside of the CS proj file. On the properties, we have launch settings, which is just a JSON configuration file, which has certain details about how the app should behave. Honestly, I rarely do modify this file, so you don't necessarily have to worry about this file until you have something major to do. Later down, we have controllers. Now, controllers literally do that. They control the web traffic. So when a request comes in and a response is given, a request comes from the user or from the client app to a controller. And then if it can recognize the type of request, then it does whatever it needs to do and gives back a response. So for every endpoint or behavior that we'll be introducing to our API, we will be modifying, creating and modifying controllers as we go along so we have a default one which is what we saw in our swagger app and it is for weather so it's a weather forecast controller and all it does is give back some data when that request is made accordingly right so here's where you define your verbs and your layout and your actions and we will be going through all of that in detail later on then we have the app setting.json. Here is where certain configurations like database connections and the static configurations that we need for our app going forward, they can be placed in here and we can access them rather easily from anywhere in our application with minimal effort using the dependency injection or the IOC container. Then we have the program.cs file. So in .NET or in versions of .NET and .NET Core prior to 6, you would have the program.cs file and a startup.cs file. Now in .NET 6, we have them both as one. The only major difference is that instead of using two methods, one to configure services and one to configure the app, it now just does everything in one straight line. So we just have a builder that is saying builder.services. The service we want to add. And then later on, we have the app dot and include the middleware. So in a .NET 5 or .NET Core 3.1 app, you would have seen something like a configure services as a method. And then you would say services dot add the service. That's the only major difference. So if you're following along with .NET 5, when we make modifications, the code difference will be very, very minor. Further down, we end, well, basically with just a static class that represents the weather forecast object. So this object has properties, and these properties were being used by the controller to be populated and sent back. So that's one of the advantages of APIs with .NET Core. We can use straight C Sharp and built-in libraries will convert our data that we're applying to our C-sharp objects um, and make them look like JSON in plain text for the client that is retrieving it. So that's why it doesn't matter once again what kind of client app we're using at the top or what technology you're even using for the REST API. As long as they're following certain standards, they will be able to communicate. All right, welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to be setting up our course policy. Now, course policies pretty much restrict the machines that are allowed to access an API. 
Yes, they are set up for security reasons and you can use them to blacklist or allow or reject certain requests coming from certain sources. But generally speaking, you want to leave them open and handle that kind of restriction somewhere else. In this lesson, because we're building the clients and what will happen is that they're going to be coming from different ports. So even though they're all in Visual Studio on your machine, it will kind of simulate different servers hosting the API and the client apps and cores will be needed to or a course policy will need to be enabled to facilitate that kind of communication. So in a few simple sets, we can get that done and we'll start off in the program.cs file where we're going to add right above the or right underneath where we added serial log we'll say builder dot services and here we'll say dot add cores all right so cores is spelled c-o-r-s so that's the one we're looking for and then what we want to do inside of this is start up like some options or configuration. So I'll say options with our configuration or Lambda arrow, and we'll create an object block. So in that object block, I need to say options dot and add a policy. And I'm going to give this policy the name allow all simply because that's exactly what I'm going to allow. So I'm going to allow all requests for any method from any header, right? So beside allow all inside of the parameters for add policy, we're going to have to give it the policy object. So I'm going to say builder, or let me say B, um, which is really a builder, but I don't want to con, I don't want to conflict with the builder object that's already present in this file. So I'll say builder lambda arrow, or sorry, B lambda arrow, and then B dot, and then I can start daisy chaining all of what I'm, I'm allowing. So I'm going to allow any method, check. And then I'm going to say dot, allow any header, check. And then I'm going to allow any origin. So any uh, you can always read, you can hover over each one just to see exactly what it's allowing. But this means allow any request type coming in with any header from anywhere, right? Allow all. And then after we do all of that, I can close it. So if you want it to look a bit neater, you can always just break the line and make them all kind of chain down below the other one, right? So that is our course policy that we have built. Now we need to tell our app to use it. So underneath in the app building section or the middleware section, I am going to put that right underneath HTTPS, use HTTPS redirection. So I'm going to say app dot add cores. So sorry, use cores, use cores. There we go. So after doing that, I have to give it the name of the policy that it should use. And we just created a policy, which is allow all. So after doing all of that, we have now enabled a nice course policy that will allow any client from anywhere to access. So our restriction will be, well, if you want at the network level, but more importantly at the authentication level, because you can't get into certain endpoints or certain behaviors, you can't interact with them unless you're authenticated. So that's what we're really going to be using to restrict. Out of the box, .NET Core APIs will restrict at the cores level. So this policy is just like an alleviation of that default policy. So that's really it. Um, there's nothing to test really. Um, the real the real test will come when we're building out our client apps and we, we get to interact with it. So that's it for now. Hey guys, welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to be creating our database for our projects. Now there are two predominant techniques that are used when creating a database to support a .NET Core app. The first technique, which is the one that we're going to be using is the traditional database first, meaning that you would have already mapped out all of your system requirements and you would have built a database to match those system requirements. Then you would have gone into our management studio for SQL, built the database, and then you build the app around the database. That's the database first approach. The next approach would be the code first approach, which is more aligned with agile development, where you're not necessarily sure which direction the database may or may not go during development. So you build with the you build onto the database 
in accordance with the app development. So you use the code to dictate the design of the database. Now, most courses teach code first approach and we will take a look at it briefly, but I want us to do the database first approach because what happens is a lot of the times when we have to build an API or an apps, a lot of the times it's not necessarily from scratch. Sometimes it's a rebuild of an existing app and an existing database and we have to work around it. So I'm going to show you how to work around the concept of there being a database already and you building and consuming that database using Entity Framework Core. So let's get started. I'm going to basically do everything in Visual Studio, but for the database bit, if you are you know, familiar with SQL Server, then you can actually use the SQL Server Management Studio if you wish to go ahead and create the tables that you're going to see me create. But I'm going to stick to Visual Studio. I don't want to tell you to download too many tools and we can go to Server Explorer. So if you don't see Server Explorer, you just go to View and you'll see Server Explorer listed there. Now under Server Explorer, it allows us to view all of the database servers that are on the network, just like we would with the management tools. I can actually connect to a database here. And what I will do is hit that, go to Microsoft SQL Server, hit continue, and then it will ask me for the server name. So you will, at this point, you have already set up your SQL Express server. If you're using SQL server, then no problem. If you want to use the local DB that came with Visual Studio, then that would have been a different option. But I'm assuming at this point that everybody has SQL Express. So you can always just go connect to your server. By its name, you can say localhost backslash SQL Express because that is the name of the instance. If you're not using SQL Express, then localhost by itself should suffice for SQL, SQL Server if you're using the developer or enterprise or pro editions. So with SQL Express, we can do that. We can leave it at Windows Authentication. We can test the connection. We see that it was successful. Then we can click OK. We don't have to select a database because we haven't created the database just yet. So when we click OK, then what happens is that you'll now see that server listed as a connection and by default it connected to the master.dbo. So what I can do now is right click and say create new SQL server database and then it's going to ask for the server name once again which is localhost slash SQL express or I can just use a dot or full stop to represent that local host and I'll give it the new database name. I'm going to call it book store uh, db. Let's just assume that the database was called bookstore db beforehand. So after doing that, now I will see that bookstore db listed. So I'm actually just going to disconnect from this one because it's actually the master database. I don't need that connection really. So I'm just deleting that connection, not the database, just the connection to the database. So now that we have our bookstore db, connection, we can actually start manipulating it from right here inside of Visual Studio. So I'm going to go to tables, right click, add new table. And our first table is going to be one for our authors. So the general outline of this is that we're going to have authors and we're going to have books. So we can actually write our SQL script if we want, or we can just use the design view. So I think I'm going to be flipping between them anyway. So we always get a default ID, which is the primary key. And I also want it to have a few properties that are not there, namely the property to be identity. So when I right click and click properties, you'll see that that little panel come up to the right hand side. And then I want to choose the identity specification to be is identity true. So that means it will auto increment. And you see here the script got updated automatically, right? So for the table name, I'm going to change the table name here in the script. I'm going to call it authors, all right? So our table is going to be called authors. We have the ID, which is a primary key, and it is also our identity. What else do we need? I need a column for the first name, and I'm going to make that one an NVAR char. I think 50 is sufficient. I'm also going to say last name, 
and Invertor. So you see, if you're not so familiar with scripting and you prefer the design view, this is a perfect mix of both worlds because as you do the design, it shows you the script that you need. So the next thing that I'm going to have is bio. And for this one, I'm just going to say Invertor, maybe 250, maybe, maybe make it a bit bigger than just 50. So it can hold up to 250 characters. So with all of that done, let us go ahead and create. So I can just go ahead and hit update database. And what it will do is execute that script. And it will ask me if I'm sure. And I'll just say update database. And when it's done, we get that green tick stating that the update has been completed successfully. So that's table number one. So let's do that again for our second table. And as many tables as you feel your application might need. So in this one, we're going to be creating the books table. So that's the name of the table. The ID, I'm just going to write in identity. I find it easier to just type it in now that I know what's up than to go ahead and hit the properties. And I just went ahead and filled out the rest of the columns. So I'll walk you through each one and what you have to look out for, especially. So we have the title, Invarchar 50, year is integer, ISBN, I set this Invarchar 50, and I also give it a unique constraint. All right, so you can just type in the word unique inside of the scripting area. Summary, Invarchar 250, image Invarchar 50, the price I'm setting as decimal 182. And if you're not very familiar with what the 18 and the two mean, it means I'm supporting up to 18 digits and two decimal places. And then we have author ID int null. So together we can set this up as a foreign key to the author's table. So what I can do is right click or firstly, let me update. So I prefer to actually create my tables and then set up the foreign keys. So after you have all of that, you go ahead, update database. And once that has been completed, then we can backtrack and set up our foreign keys here. So I can click on the column author ID, right click foreign keys and say, add new foreign key. It will then generate a name and I can just press enter. And that action introduced a new line to the script where it's saying it's adding a constraint FK books to table foreign key. And then we're going to specify that the foreign key is author ID. So I'll just replace the word column there with the word or words author ID. And then it will say references. So the two table would be books. So I'm just keeping, sorry, it would be authors, right? And the two table column would be the ID column of the author's table. So I say ID, all right? And then after doing all of that, you see the red lines disappear because now it can make sense of what I'm asking it to do. And then we go ahead and hit update again. So it will generate the script and, and update database. And once that has been completed successfully, we can now go back to our server explorer and expand our tables listing and we'll see our two tables with our respective sets of columns. Now, the reason I said ISBN as unique is that no two books should have the same ISBN in the system. So by setting it to unique, that at the database level will ensure that it cannot be repeated. So that was, uh, that was a standard database creation activity. Uh, if you're familiar with database creation, then that should have been uh, like a reflex action for you. If not, then I encourage you to check out my course on database development. However, let us proceed in the next lesson. What we're going to do is reverse engineer this database into our application. So our application can be made aware of the database that exists and the tables and their properties. All right, guys, so coming off the heels of creating our database, we need to let our app know that it should be able to connect to a database. And that starts off with us making it aware that entity framework is present and then letting entity framework know where to look for the database. So we have to install a few libraries. So let's just jump over to new get packages. And we're going to go to the browse section and what we want is Microsoft.EntityFramework.Core.SQL server. So if it appears on your front page, then fine. Otherwise you can always go ahead and search. So we're going to install that one. Once again, always click OK and accept to any prompts that you get. And when that one is done, we'll need another library, which I'm not seeing readily. So I'm going to go ahead and browse 
And the one that we want is Entity Framework Core dot Tools. So this will allow us to run a few commands uh, against the Entity Framework library. So let's just go ahead and install that also. And another library that we usually get is the design. We may need it, but all right, let's just install it. If we don't, we can always clean up the solution afterwards. So I'll just go ahead and get that design library also. So that's step one, get all the entity framework libraries into the project. Step two, let's jump over to the app settings.json and we're going to have to extend this file a little bit more. And what we're going to be putting in is our connection strings. So you see here, it's already auto completing that for me because that's just a part of the app settings that the app is expecting, right? So here I'm going to put a connection. It could be default connect. You could name it whatever you want. So I'm going to say bookstore app DB connection, whatever name you want, right? by default or when you scaffold certain apps with database connectivity uh, already enabled you would say something like default connection so it doesn't really matter but i do like when the name is explicit enough so when i have multiple connection strings i know which connection string is which based on the name now inside of this block of text i'm going to have a few parameters i'm going to have server and this is where the database is being hosted so in our case I'm using localhost backslash backslash SQL Express. The reason I have two slashes is that because the backslash is like an escape character. So a backslash S means something entirely different. So I have to cancel out the first one so it sees it as only one backslash. But we already know how that connection would look inside of the management studio or when we were connecting. Once again, whatever server it's on, you go ahead and put that there. So if it's on a machine that is not your machine, then you probably want to use that machine's name or that IP address. If you're only using SQL server and not the express edition, then you can just say localhost or whatever the instance name is, you go ahead and use that instance name. Then we have a semicolon, which is going to separate it from the name of the database. So we say database is equal to, and then we give it the name of the database, which if I am not mistaken, we called bookstore DB. So I'll just type that bookstore DB. After that, we have two other options for security and connectivity um, settings. So I'm going to have one that says trusted connection is equal to true. And then another one that says multiple active result sets is equal to true. So that allows for secure connections to the database and secure and multiple connections, multiple simultaneous connections to the database. So after doing all of that, we have now created a connection string. We need to let the app know about this connection string and let it use entity framework to initialize that connectivity operation when necessary. So let's go back to our program.cs and then we're going to start writing in some more services into our container. So I'm going to say var con string is equal to, and I'll get my builder and look in the configuration. Remember that we interacted with that configuration before. And you see here, it's auto completing that get connection string for me. And the name that I have to get it by is the name that we specified here. So it's expecting me to say, get the connection string, look in the app settings, that that configuration object represents our app settings and get that connection string by that name. After doing that, we can now say builder dot services dot, and we want to add a DB context. There we go. So courtesy of entity framework, we have that DB context and we don't yet have a DB context file. So I'm going to say uh, bookstore, DB context. We're going to have to create that file in a few. So just work with me. So builder.services.addDB context. So that DB context will actually represent uh, the connection to the database or the bridge between the app to the database. But we're going to have to initialize some options. And I'm going to say options.use SQL. Or is it use? SQL, all right, I guess I have to type it out, SQL server. And that is why we had to get that library. 
because Entity Framework allows us to connect to many different database engines, right? So it doesn't have to be SQL Server. It could be PostgreSQL, it could be MySQL, but we're using SQL Server. So here I have to say use SQL Server, and then I have to add a using statement. So control dot and enter will give us that using statement for that particular extension method, right? Next up, we go ahead and create our DB context. So what happens now is that the DB context usually is what we would write up and do it in a code first manner to say, well, model a database based on this context. So it would be forward engineering from code to the database. Now we have the database already. So I'm not going to create this DB context manually. Instead, I'm going to let Entity Framework generate this DB context on my behalf. So I'm going to go to the Package Manager console. If you don't see it at this point of your screen, you can always go to Tools and then you get Package Manager and then bring up that console. So this acts like a terminal inside of our application and it allows us to add a few, well, run a few commands that you wouldn't always get to run otherwise. So here we're going to say scaffold dash db context. And then I'm going to have to give it the connection string. So the connection string, we have that. We have it right here. I'll just copy. Well, I just need the database and the server. So I'll just copy that. So in management console, I have a single quote, paste in all of what I just copied and a single quote again. All right. And then after doing all of that, I'm going to give it some more parameters. So I'm going to say dash context dir. And when you type, you can just press tab and it will auto complete. So I'm going to say go into a director directory, sorry, called data. And then I'm going to say output output directory. I'll just leave that also as data. So I want it to create a directory called data and I'll put everything to data also, right? So I'm going to press enter and it is prompting me for the provider. So our provider would be the library that we're using for our connection to SQL server. So I'm actually just going to copy the library name here and that is going to be the provider. So I can just paste or I can't paste. Ah, I'm sorry about that. So I'm going to have to type it. So, all right make it easier let's control c and cancel this entire operation or press escape there we go and then let's try this again so i just press up to get that last run command and then before i start specifying all of those other directories i am going to place this library reference there right so let's look at this again scaffold db context and then we have our connection string. We have our provider. So we're saying this is a connection string to an SQL database. And then our context directory is data and our output directory is data. And while I'm here, I just need one slash. In this window, I only need one slash. So remove that extra slash if you have it. So let us try that again. All right, so it usually does a build before. <laughs> so this is causing an error. Let me just comment it out, All right? Remove the error and then let us try that. Third time is the charm. All right, so I'm getting a lot of data here. So it's saying that a connection was successfully established, but they couldn't log in. And I suspect that's because I took off the connectivity stuff. So let's do this again. No shame in trying until we succeed. So I'm just going to take the rest of the connection string and then at the end of bookstore db semicolon and the trusted connection stuff press enter again and this time we now have liftoff so we have a new folder called data and then when i look in data i'm seeing that i have author book and bookstore db context all right so now i am seeing all of the files that I will, what would expect. So the, here's the DB context. So in program.cs, I can actually comment this out and that error would go away once I add the using statement. There we go. So now I have my DB context for the database that we had created manually. 
all I did was scaffold it in our application. Here it has a default constructor and one that takes the, or one that initializes some options which it passes over to the DB context. So DB context here basically says, um, this class becomes a, an entity framework recognized class representing the database that we're connecting to. So that's very important. Then later down, you see where it goes on to say that it is um, initializing a DB set of type author and it's calling it authors. That's the name of our table and book and books, the names of our tables. They're initializing them to null. And then it goes on to do the unconfiguring, but it's giving us a warning. It's saying to protect potentially sensitive information, don't have it in the file like how we have it here. And that's fine because that is exactly why we do it in the configuration and then we initialize it at startup like this. So because of that, I can actually just remove that entire line all those lines can go that whole unconfiguring can go then you're going to see some other on model creating um properties or directives here where these are configurations on the entities so based on the constraints that we had set in the table we would see that we have those constraints here so last name max length 50 bio max length 250 we we'll go down here you'll see here that the isbn is unique Right, so these are all code first directives, but these are not written by us first. They're generated in code by the scaffolding engine. So the reality once again is that you might end up working with a database that has more than two tables and tables with more than five properties at a time. This is how you can use Entity Framework to generate in your own application what you want this application or this database rather to look like the DB context and everything. And then you can start working. Configuration wise, all we have to do is let it know about the DB context and it will go ahead and add it to the startup for us so our application can work. Now, moving forward, the situation might be that you may need to add other tables. You may need to add other things to the database. You will have two options. Option number one is that you can do it the same way you did it when you were creating the database and add them in the database engine itself and then do the scaffolding activity. But that would require you to always be changing your DB context. That's option one. Option two is that going forward, you do the code first approach. So if I wanted a third table here, I just need to go and add a class, give it a name, like maybe I'm going to, <laughs> this is just an example. So this is just going to be called code first table. And then you put what you want in code first table. So you can say, you know, prop int ID. So when you do code first and you say ID, it automatically knows that this is the primary key and this is going to be an identity and you can just fill in some other properties i'm just using the prompts given to me by by visual studio so after doing all of that what i would do is add it to the db context afterwards so now i can say that i want a db set of type code first table and the table name should be code first tables so going forward I can take that approach with every other table that I intend to add to the database. Once I do that, I can now go to the package manager console and say add hyphen migration and then give it a name. So I would say added code first table, press enter. And Entity Framework would then generate this migrations folder, which is going to contain a file stating all of the changes that need to take place in the database table. Now, if you pay close attention, you realize that it's actually trying to create everything. And what will happen is that you'll run into errors when you try to run the update database because it cannot create authors as authors already exists. So at this point, we will need to modify the migration a bit, but this was only a test. I'm not going to proceed with this. Instead, I'm going to remove migration and you just need to go back and type in the command remove hyphen migration. It will undo the most recent migration that was generated. And since we only had one, it even got rid of the new folder and everything. So I'm going to remove that new test table and the time when we're going to be doing our migrations 
uh, with a bit more conviction will be when we're adding our user tables to our project. So for now, we have scaffolded the database that we've designed. It's now in our app and ready for use. So we can close out that activity at this point. All right, guys. So I'm going to start off by fully explaining what's happening inside of this author class. It's really simple. One, we scaffolded the database. So what it did was create a class that has properties that model the properties that we would have added to the table called authors. So we have this class, which is a partial class, meaning that we can extend it if we need to. We can always create another class and we can say public partial class author and add other properties to it, maybe override or extend some of the properties that are there. But I'm not going to do all of that in this particular session. What has been ge generated is fine. You'll also notice that some of them are nullable. So once you have that question mark, it means that this property is nullable. So because in the database design, I did not set them to not null, or I didn't tell the database that it can't accept a null value for first name, last name, and bio. In generating the data types, it reflected that as best as it could. You'll also notice that it has a collection of books. So one author can have many books. So that is a one-to-many relationship that we created at the database level. So our class model has author, which has a collection of books. That is how it shows that one-to-many relationship. So that is all that I'm going to go into for the author model class. Of course, it is being referenced inside the DB context. So this class is just a representation of what an author record will look like inside of our table called authors, which once again is just being modeled as a collection type called DB set. So our task today is to create a controller that will allow requests to come in from any client app or from any user to interact with the data being stored in our authors table. And the DB context and our model class author will be very instrumental in helping that happen. So to create a new controller, we go to controllers, right click, click add and go to controller. And here we want to create an API controller. So you see you have regular controller, we want the API controller. Now we have three options. We can go with an empty controller. We can have an API controller with read write options or actions rather. And then we have an API controller with actions using entity framework. So this one is actually the easiest one to get started with because it will come wired up with everything that we need to interact with the database. So I'm going to go with this one. We can double click it and then it's going to ask us what model class do we want to use? Well, I only have a few and author is one of the few. So I'm going to choose author. Then it's going to say, okay, which DB context? Remember the DB context here represents that connection or that gateway to the database. So I'm going to go with the DB context. The controller name, authors, the authors controller, I can leave that and I'll just go ahead and add. Now, this process may take a while, so I'll just go ahead and give you some insight while it's doing what it's doing. If you get an error during this particular phase, especially if you're using .NET 5 or you're using .NET 6 beyond the version libraries that I have, what happens is that when you have library version mismatches with Entity Framework, you might get an error. So if you do get an error about scaffolding or anything like that, just go ahead and go to new get package manager. And what you want to do is jump over to updates and make sure that you are running the latest versions of all the libraries. All right. I don't have any updates right now. All of my libraries are in the same version and that is probably why it's playing nicely with me, but experience teaches wisdom. So I'm just helping you along just in case you run into that difficulty. So what we got from that procedure is a controller called authors controller. We have the root here that is defined as API slash the name of the controller. So it's API slash authors. And then inside of that, we have a bunch of actions. So a controller has actions. Every method that you see inside of a controller is called an action. And these actions are optimized or well, they're designed really for the different kinds of requests that will come in from the users.
So we already kind of explored requests as the verbs get post patch etc. So you would get a few actions that go with the basic requests that you would get to go against any kind of data. One to retrieve it or well two to retrieve. One gives you all. The other one gives you at least one or one based on the ID. We have one to put. Put is basically an update, right? So anytime that we need to update a record, we use the put verb. We have another one to do post. Post creates, right? So anytime we want to submit data to the database, we're going to use the post. And then we have delete, which I think is self-explanatory. So if you ever used regular MVC, then you're going to see a lot of familiarity between what you would have scaffolded in a regular MVC app and what we have scaffolded in this API controller. However, the mark differences, one, you notice that all of them are kind of decorated with annotations to depict what kind of verb is going to be used for this particular action. So even though the action has its own name, and this is really just because every method has to have a name, right? So it has a name and it takes parameters, sure. But if you look at the comments that you got from the generated code, that would guide you on how you actually interact with the method or the action. So that means when you're making the request, you're not going to say, you're not going to try to call get authors. You're not going to do that. You're actually just going to say, my verb is get, and I'm trying to go to the endpoint API slash authors. The controller, once it gets this kind of request, will know that this is the get in the authors controller, and it will return the the data that is requested. So that is pretty much all that's happening when you see those comments. It's just showing you what those requests need to look like. So here, when you get, when it, when it, you, you sorry, <laughs> you'll notice that you have the same endpoint for the get as the put. However, the difference is that one is get and one is put. So when it gets a put request with that particular endpoint, it will know to go here and not here. So let me just give you a quick tour of what the code is doing, and then we will do some tests. And when we come back, we'll look at how we can optimize what we're looking at. So our author's controller is inheriting from controller base. Generally speaking, when you generate an API controller, you're going to get that. So you don't necessarily have to worry about that. What is happening here is that it is injecting the context into the controller so when we talk about injection we talk about the inversion of control uh, container or dependency inversion which is one of the solid principles that's actually the d in solid so what happens is that in the program.cs we register our services like we would have registered the db context and once it's registered there it's now available for use in any other file once it can be injected or once it has been injected rather. So once we inject, what we're doing is we're saying, give us a copy of the context that is in the container and I'll make a local copy and use that local copy inside here for my operations. So that means one copy is being circulated around the place. And later on, we'll look at the different kinds of um, injection models that are there. For now, let's just focus on how this is happening. So once we have a copy of the DB context that now allows us to interact with the database because the context basically represents the database connection, all of the objects that are in the database, namely the tables that would have been listed here in our DB context. And using entity framework, we can actually interact with them in different ways. So for the get that is saying, give me all the authors, it is a task that is returning an action result that is also returning a collection of authors. So here you see that we actually can specify the data type that is being returned. And when we go into the Swagger document and later on, you'll see the value of having the return type specified inside of this heading. But typically you might just see something more like returning a task of I of action result. You wouldn't always necessarily see the return type like that, right? 
but when we do, do do it like this we can just return all right so basically this line context dot authors dot to list async is returning a select star from authors command so it's saying database get me this table and parse everything to a regular list and that is what i'm returning you'll also notice that they are decorated with async the methods have async and the commands have a weight. So once you see async appended onto an entity framework method, that means that you need to prepend that statement with a weight. And the method in which this code is being called needs to have the tag async and it has to be a task. So we'll see more of that when we're writing our own code, but I'm just explaining what all of these elements mean. So where were we? <laughs> So this is basically just going to return all of the authors. So if you want, you can also qualify it with a return type. So earlier I had mentioned that you have different codes that you would generally return. So when you return the data with no mishaps, that's an okay return by default. You can also specifically say that you are returning okay. There are other kinds of return types. So okay is 200. But then if we go down to the HTTP get, notice that this one is also a get, but it is saying that we are expecting a parameter called ID, right? And if you look at the, the URL, you see it's API slash author slash an example. So once you put that number after that endpoint, then it is going to get parsed into this variable. And this one is get author. Now get author is going to say var author is equal to database, look in the table called authors and find by ID pretty much. And of course that's async. So this is await and that has the async flag. Now, if we cannot find that author, meaning that it went to the database and checked and there was none, then we return not found. So that's another return type and not found is really just a 404. You can always hover over it and just read up on the status codes and you see it's returning a 404. So that's that error code that will go back when a user tries to find an author that doesn't exist. However, we will just return the author or once again, you can qualify it and say return. Okay, author. So, you know, yes, we found the author. You got back a 200 and that's the author. But once again, if you don't specify that and you're returning actual data, then it will always default to a 200. So I tend to put it because I like to have it explicit that I'm returning a 200 at this point. So let's move on to the put. Put, once again, has a very similar looking endpoint to the get. However, the verb is HTTP put. This one is HTTP get. This one is put. It also takes that parameter, which is the ID, and it will also take an object of type author because when you're putting, when you're updating something, you have to send the record that you're updating. So I don't know what changed. I don't know if you changed the author's first name or his bio, I don't know. So instead of sitting down and saying, oh, which one is different from the original, I'm expecting the client to tell me the ID of the record and give me back the full record. Now, by default, it's going to do some checks. One is going to check if the ID that came in matches the ID on the record, because sometimes clients make that mistake. If they don't match, then we're just going to say bad request. Bad request is a 400 code. So if I hover, you see that that's a 400. So bad request now tells you that you asked me for something, but you didn't ask properly <laughs> or there's something wrong with what you asked. So I can't help you. That's what bad request means. So then if we go beyond that bad request, we're going to go ahead and set the entity state to modified because this represents the entity that you are updating. So we're going to tell entity framework that it is a modified entity. Please watch it and save the changes accordingly. So we're going to try to save the changes. Once again, ch save changes async so that we have to await and that makes a method an async task. So when we try to do that, if we run into any errors, then we're going to have to 
say okay not found or just throw the error based on what the situation is of course this is all default code we can modify that based on our needs and business rules outside of all of that we return a no content now no content is deceptive because the words no content suggest an error but it's really a 204 response so generally speaking when you talk about response codes 200 is good anything 200 to 299 i guess is good anything 400 and 500 is bad so 400 401 403 404 500 533 <laughs> all of those are just bad right so generally speaking you want to do a no content because we updated i don't have anything to tell you after i've completed this operation i don't have anything else to give you right it's not like when you requested data on an author or on all the authors you only gave me a directive and i completed the task so i'm going to tell you well the directive was done and i have nothing to show you for it but just know it was okay so that's what no content really means then we move on to post now post is where we create so you're going to send over the post request using the endpoint that looks very similar to the get but because it's a post we decorate it with http post and what we want is an object of type author that we are going to be adding so this will be gleaned from the body of the request and i'll show you how all of that works and then we go ahead and say database in the authors table please add an author actually i think that there's an add async that we can use there we go so add async and then of course if i'm adding async i need to await all right so add async and then save the changes so whenever we do these kinds of changes add or even something like changing the state anything to modify the data we always have to do a save changes using entity framework after we've done these successfully then we will return and the created that action is a 201 so this one is 201 created so it's specifically designed to say yes i have created it and what we're saying is that it has been created at an action called get author and the new id is that with the author so basically the response the person will get after requesting to create an author is all of the details of the author that has now been created successfully including their id as it is now in the database and we would send them back to the endpoint get author now to make this um what this is what you call a magic string so i'm going to remove the magic string by saying get um, name of get author meaning this is the name of the endpoint but if there was an error here or if i changed the endpoint up top if what if i said get author by id what if i preferred it being called that there would be no way for the code to detect that these don't match anymore right so a simple change like that could create a massive error that could take us to debug so what we usually do is we say name of and then we can call the name of the method and because that method doesn't exist we get an error so i have to make sure that that method exists so that that error will disappear right so that's why you would see name of sometimes instead of the string representation of the action or the method or even the class sometimes now let's move on to delete so delete once again that's going to look just like the put just like the get it's taking a delete verb http delete right but we're passing in the id once again and then it's going to try and find the author so if you're requesting to delete an author that probably no longer exists or you gave us the wrong id then we're going to tell you not found that's a 404 otherwise i'm going to say database go into the author's table and remove that author record then save changes i don't believe that there is a remove async there is not right so remove is remove and then we return no content no content just like what we did when we did the update then another generated method which is not an action as you can see it's private as opposed to public like the others this one is just checking if the author exists so i can transform this into an asynchronous because there is an any async and if we make it any async that means we have to await and then that means that this has to return an async 
task that returns a boolean. So that little activity, that's your first taste of making something into an async method. Now, if this is async, that means the calling code to the async method has to await. So I would have to say, if not await author exists, then we return not found. And that's basically it. That's the tour of the generated author controller. And the thing is that you can do this all day, right? As many classes as you have that you want to build the API endpoints for, you can scaffold them using Entity Framework. And you can do that, as you can see, in five minutes. In less than five minutes, you could have scaffolded quite a few. And I just took a few minutes to explain what the code is doing so that you have a better appreciation of the different changes that you may need to make based on your business rules. Now, there are a few downsides to the generated code. And one of them is that you don't, generally speaking, you don't want your entity class to be the class that is being used to taxi data. Your entity class needs to be what the database interacts with, not your action, not your endpoint. So when we come back, what we're going to do is look at how we can control or have a or place some better controls around what data is being used by our endpoints and interacted with. Before we go though, let's press our play button and do a quick test just to make sure that everything is working fine. So this is our Swagger doc and just by scaffolding our controller and everything, we have new entries in our Swagger doc. So you can see here that it knows about the authors. It still knows about weather forecast because that controller exists. And if we look down here, we'll see that we have different schemas. So the schema here is just a depiction of what the JSON request body might end up looking like for author or for book or for weather forecast, right? So I'm going to try a get. So if you look at the get, this is what one can expect to get when they try to get an author, right? They're going to get the ID of the author, the first name, last name, bio, and their books. Now you notice that we have the square brace different from the uh, curly brace. And when we were doing the app settings configurations, you would have seen that the, the square brace represents a collection of, and then the curly brace represents one object. So books is a collection of, objects that look like that. And when we do a get as many authors as they are, it will be a collection of objects that look like this. We don't have any yet, so I'm going to try a post first. So in the post, the request body needs to look something like this. Remember I said that the post endpoint is waiting on data, waiting on data, where is that post? There we go. That looks like an author. And if we look at the fields inside of author, I'll just hit F12 to jump over there. Then you'll see we have ID, first name, last name, bio, and collection of books. So here you're seeing that we have ID, first name, last name, bio, and books. We may need to create an author without creating books though. So these are the things that I'm saying we, we may want more control of when interacting with the API. However, let us, take this for a test. So I'm just going to click try it out and uh, I'm going to delete the books section because I really don't want to provide a list of books. And then I don't need an ID because I'm creating. So I can't be telling Entity Framework what the ID should be. I'm only supposed to be telling it what the properties that I'm interested in are. So let us try David, uh, David Strawn and bio first author all right and then execute and you see swagger is so convenient because now we don't have to always jump over to postman to do this but now you see that our request response or response rather 201 code it's letting us know the response body here is our new author so in the client now you have the author that was just created you can actually show user oh you know this is what was just created you can redirect them because now you have the id you can do so many things with that kind of return data so now that we have at least one author in our system if i go up to the get and then i say try it out and execute then i'm going to see i get a 200 response with 
a collection of authors. I only have one. So yes, it's a collection or an array, but I only have one. If I go to, that was the post. So if I go to the get that requires the ID, say try it out, and then I give it the ID two, then what should I get? A 404, because there's no author in the system with the ID two. So, oh, I'm sorry, I meant one. Let me execute again. There we go. So now I'm getting a 200 response with the author that is in the system. And that's really all there is to API development at the very basic level. But like I pointed out, there might be situations where we don't want to deal with or allow the user to have to deal with all of this at one time, right? So there, when we come back, we're going to look at data transfer objects, which are the ideal way to have better control over the data that we choose to actually let our clients or users know about while obscuring what's really happening behind the scenes. Hey guys, welcome back. So the last time we were here, we were discussing why we don't want to show the user all of them. And it's pretty simple. For certain operations, for instance, the post, we want to show them the bare minimum that we know that they need to provide to complete the operation. However, by default, because we're just using our entity models, which has, you know, all the data, we could even have audit fields like the date created and the date last modified. We don't need the users to be seeing all of that. We don't want them to be able to interact with any of that data. So what we want to do is create abstractions of the real data that we want to store behind the scenes and just show them what we think is best for them. So what we're going to introduce at this point is DTOs or data transfer objects. So data transfer objects generally look a lot like maybe the entity because they have to have the same names on the properties, the same data types, of course, but they are more like models that represent the data. And at a granular level, we probably end up showing different models for the different types of operations to be completed. So I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Let us start off by creating a new folder and I'm going to call this one models. We can call it models, we can call it DTOs, um, you know, whichever name is best for you. So after doing that, I'm going to add a new folder. I'm going to call it authors. So inside of models, we're going to have models for our authors. So, or sorry, author, shouldn't call it authors, author. So my first model that I'm very interested in creating or my first DTO would be the create author DTO. So author create DTO. That's what I'm going to call it, right? So what do I want to show them when they're creating an author? Well, yes, I do want an ID. Let's see what Visual Studio has in store for me. So I'm going to say prop int ID all right, what comes next? Only name, but I don't want name. I want first name, All right? Now that I have first name, they're probably going to suggest the last name and maybe not. So I'll just duplicate that and write in last name. So control D is what I used to duplicate just now. And when you see the autocomplete come up, you can just press tab to let it complete. Now you're seeing that it's warning me about potential null values. So what I can do with DTOs that I probably wouldn't necessarily want to do with my entity model is that I can enforce certain validations, right? So actually this is wrong. <laughs> so I don't want to show them the ID. So let me remove that, right? Uh, apologies. So all I want them to be able to provide for me when they're creating an author would be the first name, the last name and the bio, right? Nothing more than those three. You can't be telling me the ID, so I don't want you to give me an ID value. I also want to have certain validations, so I can use annotations above the properties like required, and that's going to require me to add a using library. So uh, the first name is required. I can also put restrictions on it to say like um, string length, right, is 50, and that length is in keeping with what I expect for the database. So these restrictions will happen on the API level and it allows me to enforce rules at that level that I would 
that would match the rules at the database level. So I don't even have to get to the database side for the database to reject it or modify it. I can reject it at the client side or the API side rather just by having these annotations, right? So I'm going to do required and 50 for both the first name and the last name. And then maybe for the bio, I don't need a bio, but I will say the string length is 250, right? So notice required. Remember that they are nullable in the database. They're not really required at the database level, but to me, it doesn't make sense putting in a record that doesn't have a first name and a last name. So at the API level, I can enforce those rules. So how do I use this DTO at this point? Well, what I can do is jump over to my controller and then I can now modify the post to say that you are supposed to be accepting a parameter of type author create DTO. Not author DTO, but author create DTO. I also don't want to interact with author DTO directly, so I have to say author create DTO. So at that point now, I'm faced with a dilemma because my database needs an object of type author, not author create, which is why I'm getting this error. And you see here, I'm getting other errors because the DTO for creation does not have the ID field. So I have another little modification that I have to make here. I can either one, create a new author. So, so what I'm going to do is rename this to say DTO. So author here represents the data object. So that's equal to a new author object. And then I can go ahead and assign each value. So I can say, you now the bio is equal to author DTO.bio. And then the first name is equal to, and you see I'm getting a little help here. And that would be it. And then we can send over that author to the database. But that's a lot of work, especially if we're not just dealing with three fields. So that is where we call this new utility called auto mapper into action. So I'm going to jump over to my package manager and then I am going to look for the auto mapper dot extensions dot Microsoft dot dependency injection. So I have it here. Um, but if you don't see it there, you can always just search for auto mapper, but this is the one we want the extensions for dependency injection. So you can go ahead and install that package. And what this does is introduce a library that helps us to convert data types. So pretty much we're going to be able to, in one line, convert from the author create DTO to the author entity type. So let's see how this works. I'm going to create a new folder. I'm going to call it configurations. So anything that has to do with setup will go in there. And then in configurations, I'm going to have a class that I'm going to call mapper config. So this mapper config class now, what it will do is one inherit from a class called profile, which comes to us courtesy of auto mapper. So just add that using statement using auto mapper. Once again, you can always use control dot to get that quick help. And then I'm going to have a constructor. So I'll just say CTOR, tab, tab, and then we get our constructor. And then here I create the mapping configuration. So I'll say create map. And then basically it's saying from what type to what type. So source the destination. So source here would be like my author create DTO and control dot to get that namespace in there we go and then i would like to map to the author from our entity class right so that's pretty much it but then you know we may need to do the reverse also so what we can do is just say reverse map so in either direction the mapping would work and that is how we create the mapping configuration. So going forward, whenever we introduce a DTO, we are going to have those mapping configurations. So one thing that we have to do is let our application know about auto mapper. So we have to jump over to the program.cs and then somewhere here, let's just add it underneath our setup for the database. I am going to introduce a new line that says builder.services 
dot services dot and i would say add auto mapper so because we have that library for dependency injection we can actually add the mapper right here and we will specify that the type it should be using is type of and then we call in the mapper config file that we just created so once we have done all of this we can now inject a copy of that configuration into any file where necessary so let's jump back over to our controller which is where we would like to do that conversion right so i'm going to now inject the mapper here so i'll just in the constructor say i mapper and i'm going to call it mapper so two things i need the using statement control dot get that in and then control dot again and a quick way to get this injected is to say create an assigned field mapper so it will just handle that injection code for me so now we have a mapper object present so in the post i can now say mapper dot map and then i'm going to say i want to map into an object type of author and the data i want to map is the author dto of course this has to go somewhere so i need to reintroduce that var author is equal to and then that mapper code and then look at that so in one line i have now said i am getting author create dto but i want to convert it into an author object and then we will pass that over to the context so now everybody is happy so from the client side let me show you what the documentation will display so in swagger when i go to the documentation for post now i'm seeing a completely different schema this schema is the author create dto schema so you can see down here author create dto where we're only asking for first name last name and bio and notice that it is telling you all of the constraints it is required hence the red star and it can only take a maximum length of 50. of course we can put on minimum length also based on once again your business rules but here we're seeing a lot more contextual data that is specific to the creation of an author and the validations thereafter right so what i'm going to try to do is create an author with invalid data right so if i say first name blank last name blank and then hit execute what's going to happen it's now returning a 400 and then it's automatically telling us what the errors are last name is required first name is required so we can't get past that gate we just got back the 400 automatically and i say automatically because i didn't write any explicit code in the post to handle any of that right so that is some automatic exception handling happening in the background and that's really good but my point is that at this uh, based on this indication now there's validation and there are restrictions on the type of data that we're allowing in so even if you put in more fields like you try to include that id that i said we don't need right if i put in id as a field and I try to say your ID should be 20 when you're creating, right? So I'm going to say test author, right? And I'm specifying the ID as 20 and the bio is this is a test to see if the ID will get processed, right? Typically, if, if I didn't introduce the DTO where I didn't have the ID, then I would have gotten an error because Entity Framework would reject it saying that you can't give me an id and then tell me to add however in this situation when i execute it will be successful right and the id will be two why is the id two because the schema is really just looking for first name last name and bio so anything else that is extra id even if you put in your own field you made up other fields age address whatever if the schema is not looking for it it will not get processed so by the time it got to this endpoint all that got gleaned from the whole payload of the data from the whole schema that we submitted were the three fields that we outlined first name last name bio they were automatically validated based on our annotations here and then having passed through they were converted into what an author 
entity for the database needs to look like an author record then added to the database and then we got our return uh, message of 201 with where it was created and the data of the author so that's pretty much it for introducing automapper and dtos so my challenge to you at this point would be to create details that you feel are necessary for the rest of the data because when we're getting all the authors you may not necessarily want to see all the books right um when you're getting one author you may not necessarily want to see the list of books either you may want you may not want to but i don't want my entity records to be used at any point for the collection or retrieval of data so that's my challenge to you go ahead and change them out create other details i'm going to do it so I'm, you can hit pause right now challenge yourself create details and swap them out introducing the mapping of course and when we come back we can compare notes all right guys so i hope you at least took on the challenge to flesh out the other details if not no problem i'm going to walk you through each step and we can do them together so as i explained of course you can hit pause replicate what i have done but I am explaining all the changes that I've made since the last creation. So the last thing that we did was to create the author create DTO. At this point, you can make a decision whether you need a DTO per operation or just one DTO to rule them all. The danger of one DTO to rule them all is that you might end up exposing properties that you don't necessarily want to expose for certain operations. So you want to be mindful of that as you go along. So that is why I created author create DTO specifically for the create operation. It has only the fields that I know or properties I know I want during a create operation for an author. However, during an update operation, I will need the same fields, pretty much the same kind of validation, but I also need the ID field when updating because remember that the id field needs to be present so we know which record is being updated so you'll notice here that while this author update dto looks identical to the create one i also have an inheritance happening right here to a file that i created called base dto so i created base dto at the root of the models folder and base dto pretty much just has one property which is the public int id so every every type of DTO or every DTO that or sorry every entity that a DTO is modeling will have an ID at least based on the way that we have designed our database. So this is just a base value to say everybody is going to have an ID once you inherit from base DTO. I also made it abstract because I don't want it to be able to stand on its own. It's only there for inheritance purposes. So that way I don't have to repeat ID every single time. So our update DTO definitely needs the ID. So I just inherit from base DTO. Our author DTO also needs the ID and I'm using author DTO for the read operation. So I could probably even just call it author read only DTO, right? I think I'm going to do that. I think that's far more explicit now that I've said it out loud. So author read only DTO by updating the file name, I can just go ahead and say yes and it will update the class name also. So this is not to be used for any deletion or any CRUD operation, it's for reading. So it's only going to be used for the gets. So when we get an author, we inherit from base DTO because you should be able to get the ID and you have the same fields or properties and probably even more. And it could be that, you know, you want to expose certain ones for the get by ID different from the ones for the get the list, because when you get the list, you probably don't want to send all 50 fields. You only want to send five. It's up to you once again. However, those are my details that I've created. So we already know the create DTO. I've created the read only DTO as well as the update DTO and both the read only and the update inherit from base DTO, which only has base properties that every DTO should have and know about. Now let us look at what differences um, would need to be infected, sorry, in the author's controller. So we're already inheriting, sorry, we're already injecting our mapper. We know that part. I'm going to start off with the get. So I've rewritten the get to take from the author read only DTO. So it's returning an enumerable of author read only DTO. And then I change the code to say var authors is equal to mapper.map. 
remember that we need to specify the data type that we're going to be mapping to. So I'm specifying that I'm mapping to an enumerable of this data type. And the data that I'm mapping into that would be await, context, authors, list, async. So if that seems a bit confusing, let me break it out a bit more, right? So I could say maybe var authors, var authors is the data from the database. We know that this is looking to the database and getting the list of authors. I'm storing it in that. Then I can say var, let's call this model, model authors, right? Just so it's specific that it's DTO or author details, let's call it author details. <laughs> Sometimes I get um, caught up on my names, right? So authors from the database and author details would be equal to mapper.map into the data type we're interested in. So it's a collection of author read-only details. And then we want the data that we're mapping, that's authors. And then we return the author details to the calling client. All right, let's move on to our other get by details. So when we get by details, yes, we go and fetch the author. Yes, we check if it was found. And then here, let's call this author DTO again, just so that we're clear which, what it is instead of model. So author DTO at this point is now going to be equal to mapper, please map into author. This should be author DTO, right? So we're mapping into author DTO, the author, and I messed this one up. So let me fix it with you guys, right? So we have the author. Oh, I'm sorry. That's that's my, that's, oh, the data type is author read only DTO. There we go. All right. So once again, we go and fetch the record from the database. If we find the record, that means it only gets this far if the record was found. We know that already. Then we're going to say mapper, please convert author into type author read only DTO. And then we're returning the OK response with that DTO. So it would have stripped off anything that is not absolutely necessary. So if once again, you had audit fields that you don't necessarily need the client to see or know about, that's what the DTO does. It's that line of defense. Moving on, when we go down to the update, I've converted the incoming parameter to author updates DTO. And then for the update operation, this mapping is going to look slightly different. So now I need to go and fetch the original record from the database based on the ID that was provided, which we already determined should be a valid ID. And then, well, actually I determined that the two IDs match. I haven't determined that this record exists. So I need to introduce this kind of if statement after trying to fetch that record so that we don't run into any null problems. So if the author that was fetched from the database is equivalent to null, right? Then we move on to the mapping. And I'm breaking my own rules here. This needs to be find async, right? There we go. So let me fix up my code. Should have fixed this before I presented it, but it's good to see mistakes. We're all human, right? So let's go again. Var author is equal to await database, go and fetch the record from the database. We check if that record exists. Otherwise, we give a 404. And if it does exist, then we move down to the mapping. So here we say mapper.map. And then this method takes the source and the destination. So pretty much what it's going to do is say, I am converting or I'm converging these data types. So Anything that is different in author DTO that uh, from author, please copy it over. So it's basically doing like an informal object update, right? So it's updating the record values from the database with the values from the DTO that came in with the update request. And then we set it to modified and then we save changes. Now, moving on, when we are creating we went through that one already so i'll just skip the delete and there are no changes here in the delete because this one is only dealing with the id so there's no detail necessary for that so i'm going to execute once again and let's test now if you look in the schema areas you don't see anything about books and you don't see anything about author now you're only seeing the details and these are the details the data types that i am telling the clients they will be interacting with 
So here is auto create DTO with all the validations. Here's the read only with no validations. Here's the update with the ID and the other fields. And then, well, weather forecast is still sitting around somewhere. So if I get authors, we're going to be getting the DTO. So let's just make sure that our mapping works. And, oh, that's not good. It failed. So it's telling us that we got a response 500. So that means the error is on our side. 400 means the error is on the client's request side. 500 means that it's on the server side. So it's telling us that we have an error with the mapping. So that is a vital step. Anytime you are doing this kind of mapping operation, you need to let the configuration know that it should expect that kind of mapping. So we need to go to our mapper config and update it. So we introduced author update DTO that should map to author. And we introduced the author read only DTO that should also map to author. Now with those changes made, I'm just going to hit my fireball here for a hot reload. So it will just do a rebuild and then we can just come back over and try that again. So if I go to the get, try it out and execute, then we will see that we are getting our records. So make sure that you save your files, do a build, make sure the build is successful. And then if anything, you refresh Swagger and try again. But here we go. We are now seeing our records as they were in the database. So we looked in the database, we got the records, we converted them to the DTO, and that is what the client is interacting with. So if we do like a put, then you'll see that the put is far more concise. If I wanted to update the record with the ID2, so of course I have to specify ID2 in the body and I'm just going to leave everything else. So record with ID2 said test author and that nice long bio. Now I'm going to change everything to string, 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 string. <laughs> Execute and we got a 204, nothing to show. It was successful. However, to validate that I can go to execute and now I see that it's now changed to string, 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 string. So that is how you introduce details. That's why you introduce details. Once again, you may not end up with as many DTO files based on your requirements, or you may end up with more. That's more of a design decision than me telling you what's wrong or right. But the concept is that you don't want to have your entity class as the class that is being advertised by your API for interaction. All right, guys, so let us start off fresh. I've closed all tabs that are not absolutely necessary right now. And the first thing that we're going to do is scaffold our controller. So I'll just go to controllers, hit add, go to controller. We want an API controller. And once again, I'm going to scaffold using entity framework. This brings up our little menu where now we have far more classes to choose from, but we know that we want to use the book and that will have us using the data context class and the control name will be books controller. So we can hit add. And once again, if you experience any errors, just make sure that all of your packages are up to date and are the same version. So when that is completed, we get our controller that we are already kind of familiar with. So the only real differences in the code that you might find uh, would be none actually. I think this is the same boilerplate code that we would have seen with the authors only instead of authors, we now have books, right? So the same dangers, the same concerns that we had last time we do have now because one, we see we're dealing with the actual entity type. We need to change that out, right? We are also going to want to put in some error handling and some logging. So we'll be doing all of that as we go along. But for now, let us just go ahead and test and see if our books controller is working the way that we expect it to. So in Swagger, as expected, we have our new endpoint, but you would also notice that the old schemas are now reintroduced because authors are involved with books and vice versa. So because we've now introduced books, it has to bring back the author schema, but we'll soon address that. So let us try and create a new book. This is a schema body for a book. If we try it out, we shouldn't be producing an ID. We can leave the title. I won't change out anything that looks like it has a valid value right now image. When we start doing the client app, we will flesh that out. 
price. I'll move that to maybe ten dollars. Author ID is zero at this point, and then it's taking a whole payload for the author. I don't think that's right. I shouldn't have to be providing an author or the details for an author and the details for a a, a list of books while trying to create a book. So you see, all of these are reasons why we would always want to say have a DTO manage the interaction. So I'm going to remove the data that I know I don't need to provide and the author ID, I believe I have authors one and two in the system. So I'll just leave that as author one for now and let me execute. And once I have executed, it is successful. So I get the 201 and this is the first book in the system. Title is string, year is zero, price is 10, everything looks okay. Author is null. All right, we have to work with that. And if I go to the get, let me get all books, try it out and execute. Then I see the list of books coming back with only one book object, of course, because that's all we have created. So at least we know that the operation works. The CRUD at the most basic level is working. What makes CRUD require customization is one, how we want the API to look like. Um, for instance, we don't want all of this data to be exposed. So that's why we have the details and whatever other business rules might govern the creation or the interaction um, between the API, the incoming request from the API and the data related operations. So that's where business logic and business rules will apply. For now, however, we have completed the creation of the controller. When we come back, we will be retrofitting it with some details and with AutoMapper. All right, guys, welcome back. So what we're going to be doing is setting up some details for our books controller, right? So in our models folder, I'll just create a new folder and I'm going to call that one book, well, book, all right. And here we are going to add a class. Let me call this first one book dto so book dto is going to represent or i should have said book read only dto so let me change that class name here and then i can use control dot to also rename the file right so there we go and i'm going to say base dto is what it inherits from so we know that it's going to have at minimum that id now what properties should that read only have i would want it to have well, I will need the ID. We have that already. It will need the title, the year, the ISBN. It will also need the summary. Uh, pretty much everything here, <laughs> right? So any book that is being listed, probably we should provide all of these fields. However, if I am looking at the details of the book, I would probably want to see the author's details which is what i would get through this property so how do we gauge that well book read only detail right now i only want this to be what i use in the listing so let me update my controller here so i'm going to say i am mapper kind of doing it I mixed up but i'll be back and forth right so let's get the mapper in uh, and inject it there we go and then for the get that is bringing back the list of the books, I am going to say book read only DTO. That is what I wanted to return, which means that I'm going to have to say var books is equal to go to the database and get me the list of books. And then I'm going to say var book DTOs is going to be equal to mapper.map into book read only DTOs. But of course, this, this has to be a collection because if I'm booking one-to-one, -one, mapping, sorry, one-to-one, -one, then it's one-to-one. -one. If it's a collection to collection, then I have to make sure I represent the collection as a mapping type from another collection. And then we're returning an OK response with the book DTOs. Of course, we saw that the OK is kind of optional, right? So just for context this is when we're looking at the list of books so imagine the client side application just listing out the books certain details will need to be there certain details don't necessarily need to be there 
So if you're just looking at books, you'll probably want to see what properties. You'd want to see the name of the book. You probably want to see the year it was published. You probably don't need the ISBN when you're looking at the list of books. You probably don't need the summary either. Uh, an image would be nice. The price would be nice. And maybe the author's name would make sense, right? So I'm just giving you an idea of why we have details. So with the authors, you probably didn't see the full picture because it was almost like for like. But in the case of the books, we we are thinking ahead. We're saying, okay, what would we want to return when somebody's just looking for a list of books? So I'm going to put in the properties that I know I would probably want to see. So public string uh, title, right? And what else was there? I just duplicated that so I can just put them in. So I don't need to see the year of the book, year of publication, maybe, maybe not. Summary, I don't need the summary for the list. I will need the image. So let's put image there, no problem. Uh, price would be nice. So let's make sure that we have that. So I'm going to write decimal price. And then I would probably want, where am I? I would probably want not the author ID, but the author's name, right? And the author ID might be a nice touch because maybe by clicking the name of the author, you can go to the details page of the author, right? So I will include the author ID and the author's name. So ID, sorry, int author ID. Now remember that the properties have to have the same name and data type for a successful mapping to occur, right? So string author name all right so that is our read only dto that is what we're returning to the client whenever they request a list of the books from our library so how do we make that happen all we're doing is looking in the database and then doing the mapping which means that it's getting all the records here and then it is systematically well taking what it can find as a mapping match and ignoring the rest so let us take that for a quick tour. If we look in the get method for the books, now we're seeing our DTO. And if we try it out, then what we will get back is a mapping error. <laughs> All right. So remember the cardinal rule. If we introduce a mapping in the code, we need to set up the config, which I failed to do. So we need to go over create map between book read only DTO and our entity called book. So let's do that. Hit our fireball or just do control shift and B. So it does a rebuild. Jump back over to swagger. It should have reloaded. If not, just go ahead and reload it. Try it out and execute again. And this time we do get our 200 response. Now notice we're not getting the author name. So we need the author name. So everything is coming back except the name. So we have a number of ways we could do this. We could, um, for each one that came back, we go and fetch the author record. I don't like that one though. So I'm going to show you the one, Might just show you my solution. So I'm going to, on the query to the books, say include. So in entity framework, anytime we need to include details, like if you did database, you know that when you have, um, details in other tables apart from the table you're running the query against you use an inner join or a left join so include basically simulates that join for you or generates that join code for you so you just say include um sorry let me start from the top database go to this table table while you're being fetched please include the details and we just have a lambda expression here where i say include the details for the related entity, which in this case is author. Because if we look at the book class definition for the entity, we'll see that they have an author. So this virtual property basically represents the author record that is related to any one book. So just by saying include author, it would automatically know to just do that left join and bring back the author details also. And then we want everything to list. Now, when we do that, we can say any book object dot author dot name, but I want the full name. So I'm going to jump over to the mapper config. And then I can actually say when you are mapping from the book to the book read only, let me just make sure that that's what it is. 
So when we do the create map, I'm just trying to remind myself so I made the right decision. The source is book, read detail, read only detail, and the destination is book. Well, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, it doesn't really matter because we have the reverse map, but for what I want to do, it will matter. So the direction matters when you want to do certain things. So I want to say when you're mapping from book to book read only detail, I want it to do some transformations. I can actually tack on other methods here before the reverse map. So I can say for property or for member actually, not for property, for member, there we go. And then I can use a Lambda expression where I say for member author name, then I can comma separate that from another Lambda expression and nothing is being typed. Let me try that again. There we go. So comma separate it from another Lambda expression. I'll just call that one D where I can say, and I have a number of options here, right? But I'm going to say map from, which then is a method that takes another Lambda expression. So I'm going to call that lambda object map. And then I'm going to say, uh, let me just do an interpolated string where I'm going to put in map dot first name or sorry, map dot author dot first name because map is giving me access to the book object that I'm looking in for the, the transformation, right? So I'm going to say, give me the included author and his first name and then do the same thing for the last name. And then that interpolated value, when the mapping occurs, will get stored inside of author name. So that's a nice and easy way to let AutoMapper handle that kind of operation for you and reduce any other additional queries that you might end up needing to write in the back end. Right? So let's review what we just did. We converted the listing to only use our book read only DTO. We are querying the books database table, but we are also including the details of the author. And then we are mapping them into the DTO that needs to come over. And then we can go ahead and return. Now, another thing that we could do, well, let's test first, and then I can show you a shorter way we could have written that. So let us go to the get where we know we're expecting the book read only execute. And then when you look at the response, now you're seeing the author name. So it one included the details of the author and then two, our mapping handled the conversion from first name and last name into just one field called author name. I think that's pretty cool. So I was mentioning that we could have written this in a shorter way, and that is by using an extension method given to us by AutoMapper that tacks onto our entity framework core called project2. So projection is an entity framework concept where if you are running a query, but you want the results in a specific data type, you could actually just say books. So books has a data type, and we know that when we run against books, we're going to get back book objects. But what if I only wanted a, a specific set of columns? Then I would say something like dot select, and then using projection, I could use a Lambda expression and say, give me a new object and specify the different fields that I want. And it would give me back that custom object with just maybe ID and title. Of course, this is not very strongly typed because you know, I would have to do that over and over again, which is why having a DTO is better and it's easier using AutoMapper. Now, I want to just select into the mapped version of the book read-only DTO instead of having to get the regular one and then get the books because what happens is that it's going to do a select star from books and including all the author details to just give me back a few records. So that's a bit inefficient, right? So what we can do is say context.books dot include that, 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 and then after that, and I'm just going to break line so we can see where everything goes. So books include the author details. And then after that, I'm going to say, but project to, and when you're writing in project two, you might need to include a reference. So just write what I have so far. So dot project two, and then we give it the data type that we want to project to. 
and then we have to give it the mapper configuration that it should use so we can get that mapper configuration from our mapper object dot configuration provider so at that point you can just do control dot and you would have to add the using statement for auto mapper queryable extensions and once you do that books will actually just return a list of the book read only dto instead of the books that we then have to map so i can actually get rid of that extra line that is doing mapping and then just return books all right so let's test that theory so back in swagger the expectation is that we would see the same kind of result set even though we we removed the line that explicitly does the mapping so when i execute ah there we go we're still seeing the details that we expect so let me just review that with you once again using this method project 2 we can let entity framework be a bit more efficient because it will say i know i need to query books i know i need to include the details but based on the data fields that are required based on the mapping configuration and the data type that have been given i know which ones that i need to include in the select query so it won't be a select star anymore it will be a select title image price author id author dot name and author dot first name and author dot last name and then auto mapper based on this config will do the rest of the transformation and everything will come back based on the data type that we want. So I can just say var book DTOs is equal to database, get me um, all the records converted into this and a list, and that's what I will return. So, you know, as we go along, I'm going to show you little tidbits as you get more comfortable with the concepts. So what I'm going to challenge you to do at this point, as usual, go ahead and swap out the rest of the endpoints to the DTO um, equivalent of what you know needs to be in there. And you can hit pause right now, try it. I'm going to do it and then we can come back and discuss. All right, guys, so let's start off looking at the rest of the DTOs that I would have created. So my book create DTO looks something like this. I have required and string length 50 for the title. I have required and the range for the year is 1800 to the max value so you can't put in any book for negative 100 of course i could easily say something more like 1000 being the first year or one it's the minimum to the maximum right so whatever your tolerance is for the year value you can go ahead and use that i do require an isbn i do require a summary and the max length is 250 but the minimum length is 10 characters you well i made the image optional and you will have to produce a price and the price can be zero dollars because i guess it can be free up to whatever value is the maximum value of int so that's my create now the update generally looks just like the create but it inherits from the base detail so it would have made sense if i could just say book create as part of the inheritance but it can't inherit from two classes at the same time so we'll just leave it as it is um, with all of those fields and repeated validations. I also have book details DTO, which includes all of the other fields that were left out of the read only DTO, but I've retained the author ID and author name field really because while you're looking at a book, you don't need any more details about the author than the name. So we can make the client when you click the author's name, then it goes over to the details of the author. But while looking at the book, this is all you need to know so once you have those if you you know you're close to that kudos to you if not feel free to just backtrack and pause and replicate what i have for the dtos but in the controller some of the changes that i would have made as expected i retrofitted the other actions to now use dtos so book details dto is what i'm using for the get book right and i'm doing the same kind of projection with the mapper configuration so on that note let me jump over to the mapper config and replicate that because i didn't do it i was waiting for this moment so we'll actually reuse the mapping configuration for the book read only dto because i want that same kind of setup for the book details dto where the author name should 
go ahead and be mapped from the first name and last name. Now, while I was here, I was making the point that we had to do the form member before the reverse map because order matters in terms of where you place the configurations and the reverse map. Before I swapped book and book read only, it would have been saying that when I'm mapping from the book read only to book, then this wouldn't be able to happen because the one that's on the left is the one that is going to be used in the map from. The one that's on the right is the one that's going to be used on the left. <laughs> it's kind of weird, but just think about it. I'm going from book to read book read only. So the configuration when I'm converting from book to book read only is that when I'm converting and I see the property called author name, this is the value that I want to be stored in that when that conversion happens. And then reverse map means that when I'm mapping from this direction to that direction, I could actually have rules to govern that also. So the order matters in that regard. But I'm never going to be, at least for the foreseeable future, I'm not going to be mapping from the read only to books. So I don't need a reverse map configuration for anything else. So I'm just showing you how AutoMapper can help you to put certain business rules in and kind of make it easy. But I tend to use these only for read only up um operations right so read only detail and book details those are read only operations and both of them have that requirement for the author name to be flattened pretty much all right so other mapping configurations that i obviously would need would include the ones for the let me just do them here while i'm here so we need the book create detail to book so notice AutoMapper is not giving me an error when I, when I changed all the types, right? So if I said book update DTO to author, it's not going to know that there should never be that mapping. It's just seeing two data types and it is making it, you know, making note of the fact that these two are there. So you have to make sure you get your configurations correctly. So we have create, we have update, and we have the two read only ones. And I don't need anything else. So let me just delete the excess. All right, oh, I think we can proceed with that. All right, I think I might have, okay, yes, I might have erased a vital one, which is the read only. So let me just, so let me just fix it so you can see um, that's what we need. So we have the author mappings and then we have the book mappings below. All right, so I only had three for the author, but then I needed four. Once again, that's up to you and your business rules. So now that I get, I have the mapper config down, let's continue with the controller and finish this up. So for the details, get the query, get include the details, go ahead and project it. And then notice that I had to change it from the find async to first or default, because once you put the include in the query, the find async can't work. So you might have ended up making that change or you might have had that error and you're wondering why. So that is why, all right? So that is what the get book looks like. Our put looks like this. We update the property in the parameter to be book update ETO. And then we go through, we fetch the book record from the database. We check if it's null. And if it is, then we return not found. Otherwise we go ahead and do the same kind of mapping and then update the entity state, then allow it to do what it would have done naturally. And then for the post, we update the parameter type. We go ahead and do our mapping and then add the book and then we return the details and nothing really was needed for the delete. And I converted the book exists method into an asynchronous method, which then means that this has to be an await operation. So, that's pretty much it. I'm just going to do a build and make sure that everything is okay. You know how to test, so I encourage you to go through and test them out. But uh, before I leave, I'll just show you what the swagger dot now looks like. And you can see that there are no more references to the author or to the book um, entity types, just the DTOs. That's all that the clients need to know about. So you can go ahead and you can try creating of course, look out for those errors like the mapping errors in case you may have missed one. 
And if you get any other errors, you know, just let me know and we can work through them. All right, guys. So I think we're done with the two controllers and, well, what they can do. What I'm going to skip for the books controller is the logging and the try catches. We already discussed the different options that we have in the author's controller, but you can see that the controller is kind of swelling with all of the try catches and all the logging errors and so on. Once again, that's more up to you than me saying that this is the way it should go. So if you want to introduce all of those things to the current controller, the books controller, then by all means do so. But I'm going to leave one pristine and the other one in the more, you know, I'm going to say heavy looking way. Later on, we look at more global things that we can do so we don't have to repeat that for every single controller that we ever build. But for now, I think we have gotten to a good place with our configurations and our new controller, con uh, the functionality and our DTOs. So I'm just going to go ahead and in Git changes, put in my message. And once you have done that also, you can go ahead and commit all and sync. And when we come back, we'll start looking at authentication and authorization.